This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. It's been a little over a month since a mass shooting in Buffalo, New York, where a gunman killed 10 and injured three in a racist attack on a grocery store. Since then, the Department of Justice has charged the suspect with multiple counts of hate crimes and weapons charges. In this episode, we're going to head back to Buffalo to look at how the community is coping, particularly with mental health services. But first, let's take a look at why the location of the attack was so significant. The shooting happened at Tops, a grocery store that residents had fought for almost 20 years just to open. The neighborhood hadn't had a supermarket like this in decades, and as the store remains closed, many in the community no longer have easy access to good foods. See, before the grocery store opened, the area was known as a food desert, which is an area with limited access to healthy and affordable food from grocery stores, supermarkets, or super centers. The USDA considers someone in a food desert when they live more than a mile away from a food store in urban areas and more than 10 miles away in rural areas. Currently, that's more than 18 million people in the US. Now, some experts and advocacy organizations have moved away from the term food desert, saying it implies something that occurs naturally. They argue these sorts of problems actually come from a long legacy of discrimination in housing and community planning. Dr. Levon Ansari, the executive director of a community health center in Buffalo, hit on some of that history when Newsy sat down with her. Ansari says because of the lasting effects from redlining, it wasn't hard for the shooter to find a place to carry out his attack. One of the things I explained to some of my um, white colleagues what redlining looks like. Redlining is, as we know, is a structure that's designed to limit us of where we could live. And in this case, it happened to be a box that set us up for death because you, we were put, so many of us, in one space. So he calculated that there would be many of us in one radius. And that's how we became the target. But one of my friends said, and, and he makes a good point, he said, but they didn't go to the liquor stores to shoot us because there's a lot of them in the community. But there was only one supermarket. There's something wrong with that. And Sari is referring to the so-called grocery gap, which dates back to the 1980s. As more black Americans moved to cities, the country also saw white flight, where masses of middle-income white Americans left cities for less diverse and more segregated suburbs. Supermarket chains, which largely merged and consolidated in the 80s, then followed white Americans to wealthy suburbs, a move some experts refer to as supermarket redlining. The term calls back to the federal housing policies in the post post-New Deal era that marked predominantly black neighborhoods as riskier investments, prevented desegregation of neighborhoods, and prevented black families and households from growing generational wealth through home ownership. Buffalo is a notably segregated city itself. The metro area is ranked the sixth most segregated area in the nation according to the 2010 census, which compared distributions between white and black populations in major cities. The shooting at Tops just brought this phenomenon of supermarket redlining into the spotlight. About 78% of residents in the zip code where the shooting took place are black. The next major supermarket is about 40 minutes away on public transit. so. It's easy to see how the store could become such an easy target for this kind of hate crime. That kind of decades-long divestment and discrimination against predominantly black or low-income neighborhoods has sprawling consequences. And it's not just a contributing factor of what left neighborhoods like in Buffalo with just one supermarket, but it denies communities other resources as well. In Buffalo, the lack of counseling and mental health services became starkly apparent after the shooting in May. National correspondent Amber Strong traveled to Buffalo to learn more about the lack of support for mental health and other reasons why it's hard to get those resources to predominantly black communities in particular. You said you wanted to see my day. Dr. Kenyani Davis is making her rounds here at the Community Health Center in Buffalo, New York. PTSD training. Yeah. Did you guys get my email? Yes. You're gonna be there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Weeks after a mass shooter murdered 10 members of the neighborhood she serves, she's still trying to process it all. It's the community that got affected, especially when you're talking about a hate crime. Um, it was every emotion at once. She says in the days that followed, her team got to work, something they've always done. 
If they needed us in a medical component, we were there. If they needed us as community leaders, we were there. If they needed us as friends, if they needed us just to create an open space, we were there. Across the city, other organizations recognized the need for mental health services too. But when it came to treatment, psychiatric nurse practitioner Melissa Archer noticed people on the city's east side, made up of mostly black residents, were hesitant to seek help. People want to see people that look like them so that they don't have to explain certain things. According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, only one in three black adults with mental illness receive treatment. The National Alliance on Mental Illness says that's mostly due to socioeconomic challenges, stigma surrounding mental illness, and mistrust of the medical industry. Black people are often victims of health care bias when those providing the treatment lack cultural awareness. So, so you can kind of see the proximity of all of the available resources Buffalo Urban League CEO Thomas Buford Jr. told Newsy since the crime was different, the treatment had to be as well. This particular incident, this particular terror um, had a face, it had an ideology, it had an intent to harm a specific population. I think one of these things that this event has shed light on and empowered people to do is to speak their truth. When, when we were there, we had people say, we are angry at white people. For community leaders, that meant offering more counselors with shared experiences and cultures. Part of the healing process means meeting people where they are. And for some mental health care professionals, that meant setting up shop two miles from where the incident took place. The Urban League team says the numbers have increased since moving into the neighborhood and making more black counselors readily available, all thanks to temporary funding from FEMA through New York Project HOPE. Yesterday, we had three come in back to back, all crying. And, you know, and we just enveloped them and, you know, did what we do and, you know, provided resources and a listening ear. But for these mental health care workers, that means not only dealing with the recent trauma, but unraveling decades of racial mistreatment. They're dealing with trauma from Jefferson Avenue. They're dealing with generational trauma from Jefferson Davis. Luther Jr. says the incident exposed deeper wounds for the community with older people who remember a Jim Crow South and the effects of redlining, as well as refugees fleeing violence. Some of them are saying, what did I, what I ran from and what did I run to? Uh, so what this thing really did was shatter people's uh, sense of safety. And while the wound may be generations deep, counselors and doctors here in Buffalo say they will continue to be a safe and accessible space as long as possible. There was no book. I didn't go to the Harrison's internal medicine book or any of the other, you know, references to kind of figure out how do you navigate a community through this type of hurt and pain? How do I feel as, as a black woman in this community? What is the hurt and the pain that I feel for being victimized? That's what you bring to the, bring to the table. Amber Strong Newsy in Buffalo, New York.